It's an uncomfortable fact that the history of our world is all too often defined by conflict. Over the centuries, there have been many examples of invasions, conquests, and captivities. Perhaps nowhere has this been more apparent than here in northern Israel. In the 8th century BC, it was the setting for one of the largest forced deportations ever recorded in human history. Almost 800 years before the birth of Christ, Palestine, then known as Canaan, was invaded by the armies of the Assyrian Empire. This led to the subjugation and deportation of virtually the entire Israelite population into Assyria. What happened next is the subject of our story. Following their deportation, this huge number of Israelites, taken captive by the Assyrians in the 8th century BC, became known to history as the lost tribes of Israel, not just because they lost their homeland, but also because they lost their Israelite identity. The subsequent decline of the Assyrian Empire enabled these lost tribes to begin their migrations, journeys that would take many of them out of Assyria westward into Asia Minor and Europe. Our story follows these displaced people, who in their migrations invaded both the Caucasus region between the Black and Caspian Seas and Asia Minor. Over time they became known by other tribal names, such as Cimmerian, Scythians or Scythians, Goths, Celts, Anglo-Saxons and Vikings, tribes who would ultimately form the Christian nations of Europe. The untold story of this large number of people who formed the Lost Tribes of Israel should not be confused with the story of the Jews who lived in and around Jerusalem. They were only known by that name some hundred years after the people of the northern tribes were deported into Assyria. This is Auckland Castle in County Durham in the northeast of England, home to the Bishop of Durham. It's here that some remarkable images tell us something of the beginnings of our story. These impressive figures were painted in the 17th century by the Spanish Baroque artist Francisco Zurbaran. They depict, in Spanish style, the biblical patriarch Jacob with his 12 sons, who gave their names to the 12 tribes of Israel. But how did these paintings which represent characters from the Hebrew Old Testament, come to be here in a County Durham castle. Zerberan, or Thurberan, as some people call him, um, uh, painted the pictures, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, and they were uh, on their way to South America, uh, and they were stolen by, as we believe it, British pilots on the high seas, um, and they then found their way to port back to Portugal, um, and at that point, a British dealer bought them, uh, and the Bishop of Durham at the time, Bishop Richard Trevor, uh, had a particular reason to buy them. And he wanted to very much support what was sadly, difficultly called the Jew Bill that was going through Parliament. And as an act of faith and an act of witness about this, he bought these Zerberan paintings depicting the 12 tribes of Israel, and he hung them in this room, the long dining room. They tell us that, um, that the, uh, the tribes of Israel, that the sons uh, were important, they were part of our whole heritage, 
Um, Christian people have a Bible which includes the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Covenant uh, that Jesus came to tell us about, God's New Covenant, uh, was uh, from the Old Covenant given to the people of Israel, the chosen people. Uh, and that they would uh, be in God's favour. They were God's chosen ones to do his will and his work. And Jesus, we believe, came to uh, tell God's chosen people of God's will and purpose uh, in the new covenant. And he did that eventually by giving up his life and dying for us. So what does the Bible tell us about Jacob and his 12 sons? Well, the Bible tells us that uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Quite a grandiose title. It means uh, one that rules with God. Consequently, his 12 sons became the ancestors of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, they also inherited an unconditional promise from Almighty God that their descendants would grow into a great nation and company of nations that would spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, that in them all the families of the earth will be blessed. And they were also given possession, a title deeds if you like, of the land of Palestine, which at that time was known as the land of Canaan. But the occupation of that land that's the right to actually occupy it, was contingent upon them implementing in their national life the laws that were given to them by the prophet Moses. Now each of the tribes uh, inhabiting the land were given a portion of territory. And the territory was split between the tribes, each one except the tribe of Levi. The Levites were like the public servants of the time. They were teachers, they were scribes, they were priests, they were lawyers. Joseph's territory, however, was divided between his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. They were the birthright tribes. They were the ones to whom this great promise of being a great nation and a company of nations essentially applied. Now in the course of time, the nation of Israel was divided into two distinct separate kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. So distinctive was this separation that they each had separate monarchies and from time to time they were at war with each other. Now the occupation of the land contingent upon them, being obedient to the laws of God as given by Moses, they totally, miserably failed to uh, achieve. And ultimately they were uh, evicted from the land, they were deported into Assyria largely, and therefore they had to grow into this nation and company of nations outside of Palestine. Some of the coastal tribes, particularly Asher and Dan, along with the Phoenicians and the Sea People, traded along the ancient sea routes, navigating way beyond the Mediterranean. Some of the tribe of Dan decided to move north. They only had a small parcel of land on the coast and they were the second largest tribe. And so they captured a northern Canaanite city and they enlarged it and named that region Dan in memory of their forefather Dan. This is the archaeological site of Tel Dan in northern Israel. It was once a major commercial and religious center for the Israelite tribe of Dan who occupied this region for hundreds of years. Along with the other tribes of Israel, they had settled in this promised land of Canaan. The city of Dan was one of the places where the people of the northern kingdom of Israel engaged in the idolatrous worship of the old Canaanite gods, while the people of the southern kingdom of Judah worshipped at Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. In the 8th century BC, the Assyrians attacked. 
The Assyrians were feared as the most warlike nation of the time, with an empire that stretched from the Iranian Zagros Mountains in the east to the Taurus Mountains of Turkey in the west. An empire that challenged even the Egyptians as the dominant force in the Middle East. Tel Dan is a classic example of a destruction site, showing the extent of the havoc caused when the Assyrians invaded. The Northern Kingdom of Israel succumbed to the onslaught, and following a series of attacks, the people were deported north from their homelands to the Assyrian territories south of the Caspian Sea. This huge number subsequently became lost to both biblical and secular history. They had lapsed into idolatry from the time of King Jeroboam, the Bible says, and the king made two calves of gold, and he set one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. Following the division of the kingdom of Solomon, King Jeroboam established a cult at Dan as an alternative to the one at the temple in Jerusalem. He placed a golden calf in the city and built a high place. This high place was originally built by King Jeroboam of Israel in the 10th century BC, but not for the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses. Ultimately, this place was destroyed by the Assyrians and the people deported. In the Bible, 2 Kings 18, it says, And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria, and put them in Hela and in Habor by the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant, and all that Moses had commanded, and would not hear them, nor do them. Tel Dan was only the beginning of a campaign that would leave Palestine devastated. To the south, the important commercial centre of Hazor was also destroyed by the Assyrians in the 8th century BC. Tel Hazor is located in the Hula Valley at the foot of the Galilee Mountains. It was destroyed during the Assyrian military campaign of 732 BC and its inhabitants exiled along with those of the entire Galilee region. The site features buildings which include those of the period of the Israelite occupation. The entrance to the city was through an impressive six-chambered gateway, typical of the period. This reconstructed oil press is one of the few examples to be found and tells us something of the day-to-day -day life of the inhabitants of the city, an existence that was violently disrupted by the Assyrian invasion. Another example of this wholesale destruction can be found here in the ruins of the once magnificent city of Megiddo, lying in the heart of the Jezreel Valley. During the biblical period, Megiddo was one of the most important cities in Israel. It controlled the international trade routes that linked the ancient world centers of culture and power, Egypt and Mesopotamia. The Assyrians destroyed the city and deported its inhabitants. Bible prophets had foreseen the Assyrian invasions as a divine judgment on the decadent Israel nation and predicted that while they would be deported and scattered among the nations of the world, they would yet fulfill their ordained purpose and therefore be preserved. The ancient scriptures predicted that the descendants of Jacob Israel would emerge as a great nation and company of nations with an established monarchy. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. The prophet Amos described the fate of Israel as migrating amongst the nations of the world, but by no means annihilated. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations 
like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. The prophet Jeremiah stated that Israel would continue as a nation as long as the sun, moon, and stars remained in the sky. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. The British Museum in London holds many of the world's great archaeological treasures, including some which illustrate our story. The 19th century was a particularly fruitful time for the museum, as explorers and adventurers travelled the ancient world in search of the treasures that would help tell the story of human development. One of the sites of particular interest was the Assyrian capital, Nineveh. The British Museum holds one of the world's greatest collections of Assyrian art, providing a unique insight into the way they lived and died. This is the black obelisk of the Assyrian king Shalmaneser, found in 1852 by Austin Henry Layard in the mound at Nimrud in ancient Assyria. Each of its four sides is divided into five sculptures, representing the tributes brought by vassal princes, including Jehu, king of northern Israel, seen here prostrate before Shalmaneser. Assyriologists succeeded in reading the name of Jehu, which referred to him not as an Israelite, but as the son of Humri, a name derived from Omri, an earlier king of northern Israel. It says, the tribute of Jehu, son of Humri, received from him silver, gold, and many treasures fit for a king. The British Museum press booklet, The Bible in the British Museum, tells us, Omri had been such a prominent ruler in his day that the Assyrians referred to Israel as Bit Humri, or the House of Omri. The name Israel is not found anywhere on this obelisk, which indicates that the people of the Northern Kingdom had not only lost their homeland, but also their identity as Israelites. They were now the lost tribes of Israel. These images help tell the story of how, in the course of time, Successive waves of Assyrian invaders systematically deported the people of the northern kingdom of Israel, northeast, across the Euphrates, into Assyria. To make matters worse, not only did the Assyrians deport the people of the northern kingdom of Israel, but a later king, Sennacherib, decided to invade the southern kingdom of Judah, where, in a bitter and cruelly fought campaign, he captured many towns and cities. These images record the siege and destruction of the city of Lachish, one of the bloodiest and best documented examples of Assyrian siege warfare. The captivity of Judah by Sennacherib is recorded on this clay prism in cuneiform script. It says, I came up against him, and by force of arms, and by the might of my power, I took forty-six of his strong fenced cities, and of the smaller towns which were scattered about, I took and plundered a countless number. And from these places I captured and carried off as spoil 200,150 people. The site of ancient Lachish is identified today as Tel al Hasi, 16 miles east of Gaza in southern Israel. Here we can see what remains of this once great city. What happened here was typical of Sennacherib's campaign. The place reduced to rubble and the people rounded up and deported. Lachish was considered to be of great importance by Sennacherib as a strategic location vital to his plans in conquering Judah. This importance is highlighted by these carved reliefs made to show the siege and battle that followed and given pride of place in the central room of his new palace at Nineveh. 
They show the siege in great detail and how well developed the Assyrian war machine was. Here we see the ramp that was built to gain entry to the city and the ranks of soldiers as they approach in ordered rows. The stone slingers and archers protected by infantry while Sennacherib watched from this hilltop opposite. After the walls were breached, there was a pitched battle which ended in the city being set on fire. The governor was then made to kneel and surrender before Sennacherib. These acts of destruction and terror concluded the forced deportation of almost the entire population of the northern kingdom of Israel and much, if not most, of the southern kingdom of Judah. This huge number of captives never returned to their homeland. The only Israelites who remained in Palestine, other than the elderly or infirm, were the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They would be taken to Babylonia more than a hundred years later, where they spent 70 years in exile before some returned to Jerusalem and became known as the Jews. While the Jews of that time were Israelites, most of the Israelites were not Jews, just as all Scots are British, but all British are not Scots. Centuries later, the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews, tells us something of the fate of the lost tribes, saying that they were beyond the Euphrates and were an immense multitude not to be estimated by numbers. The Apocrypha is a collection of biblical writings which bridges the historical gap between the Old and New Testament scriptures and was included in early versions of the Bible. In the Apocrypha, the second book of Esdras, chapter 13, tells us that the lost tribes left Assyria and entered into the narrow passages of the river Euphrates, which rises in the highlands of Armenia, just south of Georgia, near the Black Sea. This is Tbilisi, capital of Georgia, on the banks of the river Kura. The Silk Road ran through here, giving the city great importance as a trading centre. It's also of vital strategic importance, situated south of the Caucasus Mountains, guarding the pass, which is the main route to the north. Tbilisi is an ancient city, which has seen many invaders come and go. For the people here, the story of the migrating tribes of Israel is one with which they have long been familiar. It's a common knowledge for people of Georgia to understand that uh, Israeli tribes came some 26 centuries ago and uh, some of them went away and some of them stayed here. This is a truly wonderful view and an important one for our story. For it's here that the migrating tribes who travelled up the river Kura stopped at the village of Nusreta, where some of them stayed and set up home, while others continued their migration north through the pass. This hazardous route through the Caucasus Mountains is thought to be the one taken by the descendants of the Lost Tribes in their journey round the Black Sea. Before the First World War, Reginald Pierce was confidential secretary to the North Caucasian Oil Company in Grozny, where he became a fluent writer and speaker in Russian. When the war began, he volunteered for service in the British Army, but was instead sent back to Russia, where he was attached to the Don Cossacks on military intelligence duties rising to the rank of colonel. His experience in working with the Russians in the Caucasus gave him unique access and insight into this strategically important part of the world. In 1937, he wrote an article which appeared in the National Message magazine, in which he said, It has been my good fortune upon several occasions to travel through the Caucasus Mountains, taking the route of the Georgian Road this is one of the two highways through the mountains from south to north and is known in native legendary and song as the Pass of Israel.
Well, after a quite dramatic ascent, here we are at the top of the mountain. This is as high as it gets. Down there is the Dariel Gorge. Colonel Pierce went on to observe that having passed successfully over this, the real ridge of the pass, Israel were faced with the descent into Europe. On the way down, they would leave behind them the mountain named Zion, a mountain which has always been known as such, and which has given its name to a village now situated in the pass. Well, here I am in the Dariel Gorge, and in the village of Zion, where I'm perched rather precariously on the cliffs above the river. It was on this exact spot that the figure that can be seen in the photograph taken by Colonel Pierce all those years ago can be seen, showing Mount Zion in the background. In another article written for the National Message magazine in 1946, Brigadier General Sir Standish Crawford, on a journey through the pass, observed that the Russian car driver is a fatalist, and in Zara's days, it was not an uncommon sight on looking over a bend on the cliff to see the wreckage of one or more cars in the abyss below until the winter floods washed them away. It is this abrupt descent by the Argarva River, which is known locally as the Gate of Israel. The second book of Esdras also describes how the migration of the lost tribes continued for a further year and a half before settling on the fertile lands around the Black Sea, a region which acquired a name that became synonymous with wandering tribes, Scythia. Although numerous Scythian burials have been found in southern Russia, the earliest were found at Kalermes in the Caucasus and Sakis in what is now northwest Iran. This corresponds with evidence found in contemporary Syrian texts and is the same region to which the lost tribes of Israel were deported. The Jewish Encyclopedia outlines several theories as to the fate of the lost tribes, in particular that the identification of the Scythians with the lost tribes is because they appear in history at the same time and very nearly in the same place as the Israelites removed by Shalmaneser. Another people related to the Scythians were the Cimmerians, who have also been identified as descendants of Israel's lost tribes. The 5th century BC Greek historian Herodotus records how the Cimmerian people once occupied a region north of the Caucasus in what is now Ukraine and southern Russia. However, since archaeologists discovered the royal archives of Assyria, and all the cuneiform inscriptions, we now know that the Cimmerians originated south of the Caucasus, at the, in the very period and the very region where the northern kingdom of Israel were deported and lost uh, from history. Dr. Anne Christensen is a well-respected Danish linguistic expert, and in her, in her book, who were the Cimmerians and where did they come from? Published in 1988, she states the obvious conclusion. There is scarcely reason any longer to doubt the exciting and verily astonishing assertion propounded by the students of the Ten Tribes that the Israelites deported from Bihumri of the house of Omri, that is the Israelites, are identical with the Gimera or the Cimmerians of the Assyrian sources. Everything indicates that the Israelite deportees did not vanish from the picture, but that abroad and under new conditions, they continued to leave their mark on history. The Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that the Cimmerians invaded what is now Western Turkey. So, while some of the tribes migrated through the Caucasus and across southern Russia into Europe, Others travelled west through what was then Asia Minor to cross here at Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. This is where east meets west. This ancient city occupies a unique location straddling the Bosphorus, the narrow strip of water that separates Asia from Europe. This strategically important location 
commanded the vital trade and military routes that bridged the continents. Many armies have passed through here, including those of the Persian king Darius in the 6th century BC, who, according to the Greek historian Herodotus, made a failed attempt to conquer the Scythians. He built a bridge of boats across the Bosphorus before leading his army north to the Danube. In the resulting battle, the Scythian cavalry and archers forced Darius to withdraw back to the Bosphorus, where he retreated into Asia, never again to attempt an invasion of Europe. This event underlined just how important this place was in crossing from one continent to another. The Cimmerians, in continuing their westward trek, would ultimately become known as Gauls and Celts. The 19th century scholar and antiquary, the Reverend Samuel Lysons, in his 1865 book, Our British Ancestors, Who and What Were They?, states that the Cimmerians, seeming to be Gauls or Celts under a different name, it is observable that the Welsh, a Celtic people, still called themselves Cymri. Not only did Old Testament prophets affirm that the lost tribes of Israel would be preserved in their migrations, the New Testament writers also recognized their continued existence and development. The Apostle James addresses his entire epistle to all twelve tribes scattered abroad. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. The Apostle Peter continues to recognize them as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, and reminds them of the words of the prophet Hosea, that for a while in their Assyrian captivity, they ceased to be a people, but are now once again the people of God. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Nowhere in its long journey to the Black Sea does the river Danube look more impressive than here at Budapest, the capital city of Hungary. The Danube is the second longest river in Europe, stretching from its estuary in the Black Sea to its source in Germany's Black Forest. Widely regarded as one of the most beautiful cities in Europe, Budapest can trace its roots back to prehistoric times. It's an intriguing thought, as some scholars have suggested, that the Israelite tribe of Dan incorporated their name into some of the geographical features they encountered on their travels. Starting with Tel Dan in Israel, and in the course of their migrations, the great rivers, the Dnieper, the Don, or even the Danube. Running through the heart of the continent, the Danube has provided a readily available route for armies and all manner of travelers over many centuries, including the lost tribes as they moved westward across the continent. Hero's Square bears testimony to Hungary's turbulent past, with the seven mounted horsemen representing the chieftains of the Magyar tribes who founded the Hungarian people in the 9th century. If it is the case that the lost tribes of our story are represented by the Scythians, their presence in the region of the Danube is recorded by an impressive collection of artifacts held here in the Hungarian National Museum. The Scythians built enormous burial mounds above their prince's graves and buried their dead with exquisite golden objects. Their precious metalwork was the zenith of nomadic art. This exhibition displays some of the most significant relics of Scythian art and culture and tells us something of the daily life of these people. The Scythians were renowned not only for their military prowess but for their advanced culture and craftsmanship skills. They also developed organized communities and a sophisticated network of trading relationships, particularly with the aspiring Greek city-states. The Danube was to provide the artery that would take the Scythian tribes into the heart of Europe.
By the 6th century BC, successive waves of Scythian attacks overtook much of pre-Roman Iron Age Poland and Germany. In the years since the end of the Cold War, what was East Berlin has undergone an extensive restoration program. The Brandenburg Gate is the architectural icon, not just for the city itself, but for the German people. The city centre has been returned to its former grandeur. Nowhere is this reconstruction more apparent than on this small island in the River Spree, on which stand the country's great museums. They hold many priceless archaeological artefacts, including those which tell us something of the Scythian presence in Europe. While the Scythian invasions were accompanied by much violence, there was another, more sophisticated side to their culture. In 1882, a hoard of Scythian treasure was found at the Iron Age archaeological site of Wetterschwelt on the German-Polish border. Some of the wonderful gold objects found there are on display here at the Altes Museum. Taking pride of place in the collection is this golden fish and sword found at Vitaskovo. The exquisite craftsmanship of these items bear testimony to the advanced metalworking skills employed at that time. Historians claim that the Scythians were the ancestors of the Anglo-Saxons who invaded Britain after the Roman withdrawal. The historian Sharon Turner, in his History of the Anglo-Saxons, says, The Anglo-Saxons, Lowland Scots, Normans, Danes, Norwegians, Swedes, Germans, Dutch, Belgians, Lombards and Franks have all sprung from that great fountain of the human race, which we have distinguished by the terms Scythian, German, or Gothic. The Roman historian Tacitus and the geographer Ptolemy named the River Elbe and the lower half of the Jutland Peninsula as the places inhabited by the Angles and Saxons before they came to Britain. It's also interesting to note that the British historian Nennius, in his account of the arrival of Hengist and Horsa in England, states that messengers were sent to Scythia for reinforcements. It is therefore possible to trace our Anglo-Saxon ancestors back not only to Northern Europe, but to South Russia and finally to Media, where the Israelites were placed in captivity. In AD 410, the Roman Emperor Honorius withdrew from Britain with his legions, leaving the country at the mercy of invaders from Western Europe. With the departure of the Romans from Britain in the 5th century AD, the door was left open for the coming of the Anglo-Saxons. One of the first places they landed was here on the east coast of England in what is now the county of Suffolk. Just a short distance from here is the archaeological site at Sutton Hoo, significant as one of the most important historical finds ever made in Britain. It marks the point at which the descendants of the lost tribes arrived on our shores after a journey that had taken them hundreds of years and thousands of miles. The site at Sutton Hoo was first excavated in 1938 when the owner of the land, Mrs. Edith May Pretty, determined to find out what, if anything, lay beneath the ancient burial mounds just a short distance from her home. She employed Basil Brown, a Suffolk archaeologist, to undertake a dig on her land. In 1939, he opened three of the ancient mounds and in the largest, discovered the remains of a 90-foot-long Anglo-Saxon burial ship. The use of large iron bolts suggests an earlier British origin, whereas the Angles and Saxons tended to use wooden dowels in their ships. Whichever the case, Basil Brown realized that this was no ordinary burial, but that of a rich and powerful nobleman or king. While much of the rest of the site had been plundered by grave robbers, the greatest prize had eluded them, Anglo-Saxon gold, weapons and ornaments, Byzantine silver and other objects 
that suggested links with France and Scandinavia. The treasures found at Sutton Hoo are to be seen on display at the British Museum, where this impressive helmet takes pride of place. Other items of significance in the collection include the king's shield and sword. These magnificent silver bowls clearly show the Star of David, which suggests a Middle Eastern connection. Eskham Church in County Durham in the northeast of England is one of the oldest, most complete Saxon churches in Britain. It's still used as a place of worship and is thought to have replaced an even earlier Celtic church. It was built from stones taken from the nearby Roman fort at Binchester and bears witness to the very rapid conversion of the Anglo-Saxons to the Christian faith. All the other Saxon churches have been utilised as barns or houses. This one has remained practically the same, apart from having a few extra windows put in in the 19th century. And it was very important because it was built on a pagan site. Churchyard is round. We've got a um, sundial on the outside wall, which is two pagan gods, the god of the world and the god of the sea that were worshipped here uh, before Christianity spread. The native British came to be made up not only of the Cimmerian Celts and Scythian Anglo-Saxons, but also Vikings and Normans. Anthropologists such as E. A. Freeman of Trinity College, Oxford, in his Origin of the English Nation, describes the native Britons as a union of various tribes of the same stock which passed over from the old Teutonic mainland to grow up as a new people. In this film, we've presented the case for the identity of the lost tribes of Israel and their migrations across Asia Minor and Europe from their captivity in Assyria. As predicted by biblical prophets, this brought them to the new promised lands in Europe. The promises made to their patriarch Jacob are also fulfilled, with further migrations west into America east into Australasia, north into Canada, and south into Africa. These countries, with their common law, based upon the biblical commandments, have inherited in their heraldry symbols which were once the property of ancient Israel. In the history and development of their culture, the Anglo-Saxon, Viking and Celtic peoples, along with other Christian nations, have provided missionary workers who have taken the gospel to every part of the globe. Their efforts in providing health care, education and spiritual guidance have improved the lives of millions. Over two centuries, the work of the missionaries, however imperfect, remains a powerful witness for the Christian faith throughout the world. <laughs>